A pleasant good evening to everyone. We want to welcome you once more to our midweek prayer and study hour. We welcome you with it, whether you're viewing us tonight via from Facebook Live or from the church's YouTube channel. We say welcome, welcome, whether you're viewing us from Europe, Africa, Asia, um, the islands of the Caribbean, here in North America, Central America, South America, wherever you are or wherever you will view this broadcast from, we say a pleasant good evening to you and hope and pray that as this broadcast reaches you, it will reach you in the best of health, both physically and spiritually. The good Lord said that when he came, he came that we may have life, and that we may have it abundantly. And a pleasant good evening to everyone, and we say welcome. We hope and pray you had a wonderful Sabbath, wherever the Lord providence led you, and that you were blessed and fed with the service uh, we had our communion service hour, so it was always a blessing whereby we can um, reflect and celebrate the Lord's, the Lord's session. Hour. And so friends, tonight we've come once more because more prayer, more power, little prayer, little power, and more is still accomplished by prayer than by preaching. And as long as we live, we should pray. It is only as we pray, we live. And as Mr. Spurgeon says, that which we desire for ourselves we must seek to do for others. We want others to pray for us. We must cultivate that habit of praying for others. And so tonight we've come once more in a unified voice to lift our supplications to heaven where Jesus intercedes in our behalf. I want to encourage you guys to please remember the Three Angels Voice of Hope prayer ministry, a powerful ministry, even though Sister Evans, they have transitioned to Georgia. But the line is still active in the morning and vibrant. And so, friends, remember to submit those prayer requests, 305-676-4113. Make your requests be known to God and the saints. And if you are able to join us in the mornings, log on 561-440-6854 to unite your voice in prayer, in thanksgiving, in supplication, in intercession on behalf of the saints. And friends, we want to encourage you guys, if you have not, do subscribe to the church's channel. Or if you know someone who may be benefited by the, by, um, the Wellington channel or my personal channel, have them go to YouTube, type our name in, and hit that subscription button. It makes a world of a difference. And again, friends, to receive the study guides for this, this series or other series or past, present, upcoming, email us at info at wellingtonsda.com or c.not at thefinalmovements.com and we'll do our very best to add you to our mailing list and to get these lessons out to you in a timely, in a timely manner. Again, we want to say a pleasant good evening and a pleasant welcome to all those who have just logged on. Friends, you know tonight the world is in a crisis and we believe that soon and very soon that trouble is about to break upon us. And what we're seeing now, we're seeing birth pains and we're admonished that we should seek, as we near the end of time, to cast our burdens upon the Lord, for he careth for us. And so Mr. Spurgeon reminds us that tonight we are to cast the burden of the present. Do you have a burden tonight? I know you do. I have a burden. Um, we all have a burden, a present burden, along with the sins of the past. There is a, a sin that keeps on molesting you and you have not really gotten the victory over that particular sin and today you're strong and tomorrow you're weak let's cast that sin upon the Lord but not just the burden of the presence and the sins of the past but also the fear the apprehension of the future upon the Lord the Bible says that perfect love banishes all fear and we have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord led us in his time past and those whom John said would be lost are the fearful. We want to cast that fear upon the Lord tonight. And so tonight you may be in a difficulty. You may be in a financial difficulty, a child rearing difficulty, a health difficulty. But this I do know in the words of the Lord that every difficulty, Lizzie, every difficulty is a call to prayer. And it is true. That God oftentimes causes men to fail us so we can look to our Heavenly Father. And Mr. Spurgeon, as anything, is a blessing which makes us pray. 
And so, friends, tonight, I don't know about you, but I have sinned. I, I have sinned, and tonight I am claiming 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, where the Bible says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. Friends, we don't have to sin. Sin is a choice. And if any man sin, this is a, a generic term, mankind, man, woman, if any man sin, whether it's sin of omission or sin of commission, we have this to comfort us tonight. Tonight we have an advocate, an added voice with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And I'm so thankful tonight that he is the propitiation. That word means sacrifice. That, 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 that word really means uh, intercessor, a mediator uh, for our sins. He's a substitute for our sins. And not just for us only. Oh, but also for the sins of the entire world, brothers and sisters. And God's love is like Sherman Williams. It covers the entire world. And so tonight, brothers and sisters, as the song rightly says, I don't know if you know it, I have a Savior, he's pleading in glory, a dear loving Savior, though earth friends be few. And now he is watching in tenderness near me, oh, that my Savior was your Savior too. Do you know it? For you I am praying. For you I am praying, for you I am praying, I am praying for you. I have a father to me has given a hope for eternity blessed, said and true. And soon he will call me to meet him in heaven. But oh, that he had, let me bring with you to tonight, saints, for you I am praying. For you I am praying, for you I am praying, I am praying for you. You know, friends, there is a place for personal prayer. There is a place for family prayer. But there is also a place for corporate prayer. And tonight, I don't know what your requests you may have, but go ahead and put that prayer request in the chat group tonight whether audible or silent, let us know what's on your mind, what's on your heart, and we will definitely try to put these requests to God. You know, as long as we live, we should pray. It is only as we pray that we live. And so tonight, while I pray, and while you plead, and while we see our own sweet need, I encourage you now to look to the hills from his cometh our help. Tonight, our help coming from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Please bow with me in prayer. O most kind and loving Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy most holy and righteous name. And from the rising of the sun to the going down, Lord, your name should be praised. And tonight we come once more as a collective body, though we are separated by, by land and sea, but through the internet we lift our voices in unison and hearts, saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercies. Thank you for your sustenance, your protection. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die for us and that he is now interceding for us in the courts above. Tonight, Lord, we've come because we have no other help on earth and we have no other help in heaven but you. And tonight, Lord, if you should withhold your hand and face from us, Lord, whither shall we go? So we come humbly, casting ourselves in the mercy of Christ and his redeeming blood, saying, Father, forgive us. For we have sinned in word, in thought, and in deed. We have broken thy statues. We have broken thy everlasting covenant. And tonight we know that the wages of sin is death. 
but tonight we appeal to the God of mercy and compassion. Oh Lord, we, we take no pleasure in sin. And tonight it pains our hearts to know that we are still committing sin when you have been such a good and a kind and a compassionate and a loving Father. Tonight we pray for deliverance, that you'll grant us victory, O oh God, over the sins that does so easily beset us, the sins of our youth, the sins that we have cultivated, the sins that we have been handed down by our parents, these strong, Lord, proclivity towards evil, oh Lord, break these fetters, we pray, and deliver us. And may we not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage, O oh God. Tonight we plead that you will keep our names, our children's name, our wives and husbands, our family names, O oh Lord, in the Lamb's book of life. May you pour it upon us tonight, Lord, the early and the latter rain power. O oh Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to give us victory over sin, to assist us in the sanctification process. Tonight, Lord, there is so much we have to lay and to, to appeal to you for. But remember, Lord, the sick and the shut in among us. Remember our own sister, Sister Carmen, Lord, who um, underwent surgery and she is recuperating. We pray you'll bring her back to a speedily recovery. And the myriads of Adventists all over the world, Lord, who are on the bed of affliction, Lord, we present them to you. Many of us, Lord, because of our ignorance to your health laws, we have transgressed and we have brought this sickness upon us. So, Lord, teach us how to best live in harmony with the laws you have given for our beings, Lord. And so we can best glorify you even in our bodies. Remember, Lord, the marriages, Lord. Remember the children that are born to parents within the remnant church, those who are off in college, those who are in elementary school. Remember, Lord, the prodigal sons, Lord, and the lost coin. Oh, we pray that the Holy Spirit will, will shine light into their darkened conscience and bring them to an awareness of their need for Jesus. We lift up, Lord, every branch of the work Remember, O oh God, especially the elections that are taking place, Lord, especially in our conference, the regional conference. This week, Lord, the Southeastern Conference will be electing a new president, Lord. And we know that it's a time where people are jockeying for this candidate. But, Lord, may your perfect will be wrought. And may you select the men and women whom you'd have to lead your church in this part of the vineyard. Remember all our institutions, Lord. Remember our workers, the pastors, the evangelists, the Bible workers, the call porters, the canvassers, those who are engaged in self-supported ministry, Lord. We pray that you will be with them. You'll, and as their days, O oh God, so shall their strength be. Father, we know that time is almost finished. It is evident that soon and very soon the angel will lose those four winds. And we pray, God, that the seal of God will be written upon our hearts and our minds. Tonight we have come once more, Lord, to be instructed in our heritage, to gleam encouragement, Lord, from those who have gone on before us. Grant us even now a blessing as we open your word and look once more into another life of our pioneers. We pray that you will continue to be with us and we pray that when time on earth shall be no more, everyone, Lord, who's on the line tonight or who will have viewed this broadcast at a later, a later date would have made their calling and election sure, would have made and found a friend in Jesus is our prayer in his precious name. Amen. All right. Good evening, everyone. I know we've had a long day, work, school, and so we won't keep you long tonight. You know, a sermon doesn't have to be eternal to be immortal. That's what, that's what um, C.D. Brooks says. And so tonight we're continuing, brothers and sisters, welcome once more on the trailblazer, still blazing for the Lord. Um, our thematic text has been a profitable one for this series, 
Psalms 11, verse 13, which says, Nathan, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And we are using a stanza from Christian Burdell, May the fire of their devotion light their way. Friends, we know as we near the end of time, God wants us to have an experience, an experience with him, an experience in the things that pertaineth to the closing up of the work in the message. And, you know, we can obtain this experience, but we are told many of us are too indolent. We are too lazy and wrestling with God, how few know what it is. And so, friends, we have been on a journey tonight exploring the life of our pioneers historically, chronologically, but more so experimentally. And tonight we're going to take a look at another of our pioneers. His name is Stephen Hen. Stephen N. Haskell, I skipped the slide. Stephen N. Haskell, one of my favorite pioneers, um, um, has been a, such an inspiration to me. And there's so much we have to learn about Stephen Haskell's life. We won't be able to, to do it in one session. So we will probably do it in two or three, probably three, um, three, three studies to see what we can learn and apply from the life of Stephen Haskell to make us a better Christian looking forward to and seeking to hasten the Lord's second coming. Hope you were able to print off your lessons. If not, just jot the answers and the concepts down and we'll do our very best to move on. Now, Stephen Haskell, he was born in 1833. Stephen Haskell was born in, o in Oma, Massachusetts to parents who were members of the Congregational Church. Now, 1833, rings a bell? Yes. Stephen Haskell was actually born the year that the stars fell. Wow, powerful. And wasn't, and wasn't he a star? He was a shining star. As a matter of fact, I dare say no other pioneer, no other pioneer did more extensive missionary work than Stephen Haskell. Yes, John Andrews was the first missionary to go overseas. Yes, we know that. But Stephen Haskell, no other pioneers come past land and sea to make one proselyte for Jesus than the life of Stephen Haskell. Truly, he was a shining star for Jesus. We know that the stars fell under the sixth seal. Uh, John says, and behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black and sack of air and the moon fell from, and the blood, moon became as blood and the stars fell. 1833, that was the last of the prophetic signs that, was, um, that should be visible in the heavens. And we're told, this is historical, friends, while folks are waiting for this to happen under the pre-tribulation rapture concept, we know this already has already happened. We are told, but history says now, history states that the falling of the stars, which the prophecy speaks, happened in the 13th of November, 1833, in the United States. States of America. It is reported, friends, that um, Peter McMillian reported that from 100,000 to 200,000 stars fell per hour. And that year, Stephen Haskell was born. And truly, he was a shining star for Jesus. At age number eight in 1841, now bear in mind, when Stephen Haskell came on the scene, the Millerite movement, which was started by William Miller, Joshua V. Himes, and Charles Fitch, Apollo Seal, and these great guys, was now coming off the scene. So Stephen Haskell was not born under the first angel's message. His life now comes on the scene after the Millerite message is closing out and Seventh-day Adventism is taking off. In 1841, he's eight years old, and he makes a very bold move. He actually signed a temperance pledge. Now, back in those days, the temperance movement was a powerful movement. It was anti-smoking, anti-drinking, and it was at that time every Christian, yeah, lent their voices and their influence into repress and suppressing one of the greatest evils that ever plagued society uh, during the Prohibition time. So at, at age eight, he was conscious, a very conscious young man, of what was happening, and bear in mind, he was from a Christian home. His parents were Christians and, and they definitely instilled godly principles in Stephen Haskell. And this now helped to shape and to formulate 
who he was as a man, as a missionary, as a preacher, and as an author for Jesus. Now, in 1848 now, four years after the disappointment, he is 15 years old. And the record said now he becomes converted. Now, what does that mean? It means, simply means he accepts Jesus Christ as his personal savior from sin and join his parents' church. During his teenager years, he learned the, the soap-making trade. That, 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 let, me, let me just stop there. You know, today I was talking to a friend of mine and, 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 and they're watching this documentary and they're saying there are so many carcinogens, carcinogens in these products we put into our bodies. And so, friends, listen, it, 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 the more natural you can go, it's always better for you. Um, the soaps that we use today, you know, the skin is the largest organ of the body. And the soaps that we use today, we have to be very proactive in what we're putting on our skin because what goes on the skin goes in the blood. And if the blood gets tainted, then poison. So I appeal to you, learn the art of soap making. It's a powerful art. Um, something that you can, wives and husband can get involved in children. It's a powerful art. And who knows, you may be able to have a business. But still, Stephen Haskell, at the age of 15, he had learned, Lizzie, the art of soap making right as a trade and he was he was also hired by an old farmer named named how or how to help manage his farm so at 15 he's working trying to make a living trying to sort himself out and one of the things i like about stephen haskell he was always he always had an entrepreneur spirit as a matter of fact you know all of our pioneers they were entrepreneurs in their mentality because they discovered it was very very difficult to work for Jesus and work for the man. <laughs> Very difficult to embrace the seventh day Sabbath, keep the Sabbath according to how Moses and Isaiah um, has given instruction, and still work for the man. And so by, by large, most of them, all of them, they were entrepreneurs. They had their own businesses. They started to do what they could on the side and use that to fund the gospel. Because bear in mind, there was no tithing system in this time frame until John Andrews brought the tithing system back to light. So here it is now. He's 15, he's making soaps, he's also making hats, he's, he's, he's doing things with his hand. At the age of 17 now, a defining moment in Stephen, Stephen Haskell's life. The, Bible, the record says now, at age 17, 1850, now bear in mind now, Millerism has passed off the scene. Adventism is, sh is taking shape and form. By this time frame now, Ellen White is now called to the prophetic office. She and James White are touring. They are seeking to gather the scattered flock. So a lot is happening, Lizzie, in the Northeast. At age 17 now, he marries Mary Ho, the daughter of the farmer Ho, who he worked for. After promising his fa her father, he would care for her after he died. A lady 20 years older than he, she was in poor health. And so here's the situation. He's a 17-year-old young man. He is working for a farmer. The farmer is about to die, and he has Stephen Haskell to pledge that he will take care of his daughter. Now, bear in mind, she's way his senior, 20 years older than Stephen Haskell. She is also an invalid very sickly, wheelchair bound. What would possess a young man to even do this? But the record said now, and I'm, I'm reading um, from Spall and McGann. Start, you want to read first or not? You want to read first? All right. Spall and McGann, look what happened now. On his deathbed now, he says now, promise. Promise me, the dying man begged. Promise me you'll take care of Mary when I'm gone. Okay, so Mary, that's an important name to remember because we're going to see that Satan tried to trip up Stephen Haskell when Mary died. And we're going to use that also for a teaching point, right? So remember Mary. Please read now. She's so helpless and she'll be all alone in the world. Because she was an invalid, right? Please read now. 17-year-old Stephen Nelson Haskell listened to the old man's plea. All right. Mature beyond his years, Haskell sol solemnly promised to take care of Mary, the daughter of the old man, his friend, Farmer Howe. Mary Howe was extremely ill and suffered from partial paralysis. Haskell worked for her father, who was now dying. When Farmer Howe died, he left his farm in Haskell's care. And so he gave him the farm. Okay, it's yours, but promise me you will take care of my 
daughter. Now, the only way Stephen Haskell could rightly take care of his daughter was to marry her, right? The record said now, uh, partially to fulfill his promise to the dying man, but mostly because he cared deeply for her. So there was a deeply, I, 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 and I, I could imagine as you know, he's working around the farm, he would obviously come in contact with, with, with Mary, right? And ask Mary to become his wife. The year was 1850. Mary was 20 years older than Stephen Haskell. They would share nearly 45 fulfilling though childless years before Mary would pass away to her rest. So 45 years they were married. And so here is Mary, all right, who, and, you know, uh, obviously um, a young Haskell. And so the age, when you look at it, there is a 20, 20 years age difference. Now, it begs the question, right? Did this hurt? or help Stephen Haskell? Was God leading Haskell in marrying a, a woman 20 years his senior, very, very sickly? He never had a child. Um, what, 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 what came out of this 45 years union? Note, this, please read now, this youth. This youth had learned to move forward when God opened a doorway of opportunity or duty to him. All right. Little did he realize that in his future, God would open many doors to him which would lead him to faraway countries like India, China, Japan, New Zealand, Africa, and Switzerland. All right. He would become a leader of leaders. Yes. An esteemed evangelist. Uh -huh. An outstanding administrator. Yes. And a pioneer in missionary promotion at home and abroad. He would learn, believe, and follow the third angel's message with all his heart and soul. As Christ's last message to men, and the one business of Seventh-day Adventists to his mind would be to give this message to the world. So here we see, brothers and sisters, you know, Haskell believed with all his heart and soul and mind that God was leading him to marry Mary Ho, which became Has uh, Stephen Haskell. And, and 45 years of union, and out of this, obviously no child was birthed, but there were many, many great exploits that was done. Now... One of the questions that you know we tend to get from this, and many people tend to use Stevens Haskell's marriage as a justification or a leeway for marrying somebody you know more years your senior. And so the question tonight is now an important: What does the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy say about marrying an older person? Is there any biblical counsel that we can get? Um, from the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. Now, friends, I have actually combed through the Bible, and I haven't found any text um, that um, is for it or against it. I believe that marriage is, uh, you know, is a gift from God, and it should be entered into with deep counsel, prayer, fasting, be proactive. It's, it's, it's not something that should be done half asleep, right? But does the Bible give any, any cautions or you know, speaks to the fact that, you know, we shouldn't marry a person older. As a matter of fact, in my research and in the Spirit of Prophecy, this is what I found. No, the Bible, the Bible places no requirements for age in marriage. Now, we're not going to go crazy and fanatical like what we see happening in India and these cultures where little children are marrying grown musky men. That's not what we're talking about. So that is, that is almost a sick practice. Right, so we're not we're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about now a, a, a person who is an adult. Right, you are you are of, of age. In some cases, we're looking at 18, 19. Right, right. Uh, Mrs. White made no statement in specifying a year or any other number of years as a gap too large, but she did say that there should not be a great difference in ages between husband and wife. Here is one of such statements. From the ministry of him. So why she didn't really specify an age, but she cautioned that there should not be a massive age gap between the male and the female. And one of the reasons why is because, and I know, you know, the, the, the radical feminists may not like this, but it is, it's a fact that women possess less vital force than men. That's a fact. 
You know, and if you're, if you're one of those radical feminists, you will take offense to that, brothers and sisters. But it's a fact. Women, women are built different from man, right? They, they're built different. That's how God made the sexes, right? And it's no pun on women. It's not taken away from, from a woman's uh, uh, um, ability to learn and to earn and to, 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 to make her way in the world. No, it's just from a physiological and from a scientific. And how do I know? Why is it then, brothers and sisters, that when we have these transgender who have gone through operation and they want to compete when a male wants to compete in a female, um, a female sports event, why is it that there's a great backlash? Because obviously, male have more muscular, we're defined, we have more energy than female. And so many people say no because it would be unfair. So we're not going sex, we're just being real. This is what she says now, very, very profound about marrying someone. So now, now I want you to focus on the words. Now, friends, let me say this. I know some super duper people right now are going to say, well, what does the science say? My friends, I, I, as a person, I do appreciate science. But I'm not waiting for no science to validate what the spirit of prophecy says. If the spirit of prophecy says it, it is scientific. And I believe it. Now let science catch up. But this is what she says in a time now where there was no scientific um, test made. But logically, looking back today, we can say she was right on. Ministry of Healing, page 3, 5. Look what she says now. Please read now. The parties. The parties may not have worldly wealth, uh -huh. but they should have the far greater blessing of health. And in most cases, there should not be a great disparity in age. You see, so there should not be a great dis. Now, what's a disparity? Now, I'm looking. So now, give me an example. You're talking about now. Uh, 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 a 25 and a 75. 25 year old young man or marrying a 75 year old woman. What in the world? What? What? That is. <laughs> come on, our brothers and sisters. Yeah, I understand. Nobody wants to be alone, but brothers, it's come on. Or vice versa. What in the world would a 25-year-old be doing with a 75-year-old man? Brothers and sisters, at that time, but, but he, his wise man says that, 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 that nature goes to sleep. You not hearing me? <laughs> That's a fact. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that the, the, the grinders cease because they are few. That's a fact. Now look what she says. So there should not be a great disparage, right? Please read now. She says now. A neglect of this rule may result in seriously impairing the health of the younger. Now listen now. So this, 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 so this is why the counts, because the younger now will be taxed. Please read now. And often the children are robbed of physical and mental strength. So, so say per chance now. Wow. Did you guess it or not? So who's affected by this? The offsprings. The offsprings are affected. Wow. Somebody say, well, give me the science. This is the science. God said it, that's science, okay? The children are affected. You got to think. Please read now, she says. They cannot receive from an aged parent the care and companionship which their young lives demand. Mm -hmm. And they may be deprived by death of the father or the mother at the very time when love and guidance are most needed. So friends, here are some timely cautions. That if you are right now contemplating marrying somebody 50 years your senior, 40 years your senior, you know why there's no, there's no counsel not to, but brothers and sisters, you need to know what you're getting yourself into. Because again, if you have offsprings, what happened? Who will be the father? Who will be the mother? Who are there to guide these children, brothers and sisters, right? You think of these things and you pray about these things as you seek to seek to find your, your life partner, right? Now, this is, a, this, this is an powerful one. Now, this is from um, Selective Messages, book two. Right? Again, she counsels what will happen when we marry people too old you know, or senior. Please read now another, another cause of what? Another cause of the deficiency of the present generation in physical strength and moral worth is men and women uniting in marriage whose ages widely differ. Mm -hmm. It is frequently the case that old men choose to marry young wives. Mercy. By thus doing, the life of the husband has often been prolonged, while the wife has had to feel the want of that vitality which she has imparted to her aged husband. No, stop there. Did you get this or not? So, it, so it, it, from what I'm getting, it does add to the life, but, but it takes away. Woman, watch yourself now. 
don't, I'm you, don't, don't let these old, old, old cougar men rob you of your sustenance, your strength. Right? Watch out. Right? Powerful. Please read what she says. It has not been the duty of any woman to sacrifice life and health, mm. even if she did love one so much older than herself and felt willing on her part to make such a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. She goes and says, please read now. She should? She should have restrained her affections. She had considerations higher than her own interest to consult. She should consider, if children be born to them, what would be their condition? All right. It is still worse for young men to marry women considerably older than themselves. Mercy. The offspring of such unions in many cases where aged, ages widely differ have not been well-balanced minds. Mm. They have been deficient also in physical strength. Wow. In such families have frequently been manifested varied, peculiar, and often painful traits of character. Mm. They often die prematurely, and those who reach maturity in many cases are deficient in physical and mental strength and moral worth. Wow, powerful. We need to give Hollywood this, or Hollywood, brothers and sisters. So that's the counsel, brothers. I'm not here trying to get in, in, in people's business, you know, and, and people's married life, but I'm just simply saying, brothers and sisters, that there are counsels um, given to us to guide us as we seek a significant other to be our life partner, Bear in mind, it's not just you. You have to look at your offsprings. Will your husband outlive you? Will you outlive your husband? Who will be there to guide the children when they need guidance? You see, brothers and sisters, you have to factor these things as you seek um, a significant other. And through much prayer, I believe that God will guide you. And he will, right? But for Stephen Haskell, bear in mind, this was before visions were given. So 20, for 20 years, her senior. But I'm going to show you, it became a blessing for Stephen Haskell because Mary was actually a school teacher. She took him to school. Hey, man, you know what I'm saying? And it was, it was through her, you know, tutelage, she helped to sharpen and refine Stephen Haskell's writing ability. He was an author like none other, brothers and sisters. And this man wrote three of the most powerful books that has ever been written. You hear me, brothers and sisters? The cross and the shadow stands by its, in, is in a league of its own. Stephen Haskell was responsible for preparing Bible studies. We're going to look at that. So again, there was a lot of good that came out of this union. But again, this was post, pre Spirit of prophecy, pre-vision, we're living on the post, right? The other side of Jordan, counsels are given to us. So we cannot use, I've known many who, who have used Stephen Haskell's life to justify marrying a person 40 years their senior. I've, 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 people have reached out to me, what do I think? And they've always used Stephen Haskell. But again, we have to go back to the counsels given to us. And, we, and again, I'm not trying to get in people's business, you know what I'm saying? I'm just simply saying that there's counsel out there to guide you and look at the long term. Project yourself in the future. There are two things Mr. Spurgeon says, the people of God, Christians should not be without. It is prudence and forethoughtfulness. Did you hear what I just said, brothers and sisters? Two things you cannot be bereft of in these last days, prudence and forethoughtfulness. Project yourself in the future. And this is what makes the papacy so, 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 so powerful because they are, they, 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 they kind of project themselves in the future and see what would happen if they make this move. Let's not let emotion, because I'm gonna tell you something, as Pastor Liebird oftentimes say, one of these days the honey will run out of the moon. Right? Through prayer, let God lead you to a suitable partner that will be a, a, an assistance rather than a hindrance to you and your offspring, right? So I, I, know I, I won't go any further. Than now, so here it is now, Steve Barnett. He says, at, sem, at, at 17, he's married and doing this thing. Now, in 1852, he's 19 now. And he hears his first Advent sermon. Now, not Seventh-day Adventist. Advent men, Christ's second coming. And was so enthusiastic about the subject that he 
instantly began preaching along with his soap selling business. He was, a, and that's why his book is called The Man of Action. Haskell didn't play around. As a matter of fact, did you know that Stephen Haskell, no other pioneer, was more versed in the spirit of prophecy than Stephen Haskell? As a matter of fact, friends, I'm going to tell you something. When you read Stephen Haskell's book, The Cross and the Shadow, Stephen Haskell just cuts a large paragraph from the spirit of prophecy and just worked that thing. Definitely, right? So he was a man who was a man of action. And in an age where there is a, where the Laodicean syndrome is hovering over our churches, we need people of action. People who will take action for the right, action for health reform, action for justice reform, action for marital, for educational, for child, for preaching, who will take action to all the reforms that God has given to us instead of having them lie dormant in our lives. Now, so Haskell is about preaching now. Look what happened now as um, Spawnham again characterizes now, captures his preaching assignment. Please read now. He, he talked. He talked of that sermon to everyone he met and was presently asked by a neighbor why he himself did not preach. Uh -huh. Haskell was at first unsure and preached his first sermon under great embarrassment. From that time on, he combined part-time Advent preaching with selling the soap he manufactured. All right. Now, so at 20 now, so he's preaching, doing his thing. He's a little bit rough, you know, over the edges. But again, he was sincere. The sincerity marked his work. And God was about to, 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 to use him for a greater good now. Now, at age 20, 20 years old now, he learns of the Sabbath from William Saxby in Springfield, Massachusetts, shortly before a trip north into Canada to preach to Adventists. Saxby apparently gave him a track called Elihu on the Sabbath. Shortly after, he began keeping the Sabbath. Now, it's amazing. So by this time frame now, 1853 now, what's happening now? Um, our pioneers now have seen the benefit of the printing press, Habakkuk, write the vision, make it plain. They took that text literally. They realized that, 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 that the press was very needful in the early church's history, and there's power in the press. Today, there's power in the press, brothers and sisters. Don't you know that? There is power in the press. Why do you think, I was talking to a, 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 um, a, a friend the other day, we were just reflecting on COVID, and we were saying, what would possess people in the midst of an epidemic to stack up on toilet paper. Like who, who, who's, who promulgated that? I mean, if a pandemic is coming, man, get some food, toilet paper. And we were laughing by saying it's amazing that people were stacking up on toilet paper when half the world is constipated. <laughs> I'm saying so, but you know who, who told them the press? Somebody on CNN or, 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 um, or um, what's the other station? And Fox? said, get toilet paper, and it was a toilet paper frenzy and paper towel. Couldn't even get any. We see the power of the press. So by this time now, our printing presses are in full steam, printing the present true tracks, the Sabbath, second coming, city of the dead, the sanctuary. And a track was used to enlighten Haskell. Now, no, please, in 1853. In 1853, the review began to publish a little track entitled simply, Elihu on the Sabbath. All right, Elihu, what a name. Elihu on the Sabbath. Now, where does this name come from? It rings a bell? Elihu? It rings a bell? No, sister not, no? All right. And I, I, I had to do, I had to do, well, I, I had to do some digging. Why would they entitle Elihu on the Sabbath? What, what, who is Elihu? Is Elihu in the Bible? Yes, he is. Now, remember when Job was sick and Job, Job's friends came to comfort him. And Job, his three friends, or two of them, I think, was Job says, you're a miserable comforter. The only person who gave Job comfort or whose counsel made sense was Elihu. You see? And so I believe it was from that perspective now that they took that, that scenario, Elihu, who encouraged, they, who encouraged Job on the Sabbath, to use his name, Elihu, on the Sabbath, to encourage the people 
to keep the Sabbath. You see, friends, look it up. That's, that's, that's the, um, the genesis of this whole scenario, Elihu on the Sabbath. That's where his name came from. He's in the Bible. Look it up, right? Now, so the track is written. Please read now. This track. This track was to play a large role in making Stephen and Haskell a Sabbath-keeping Adventist. Mm -hmm. While traveling to Canada to visit a group of Adventist believers, Haskell changed trains in Springfield, Massachusetts. He thought it would help if he could store his trunk there and travel lighter. Now, friends, look at the providence of God now. Look how God is working, all things working together for his good. Please read now, William Saxby. William Saxby, who had a shop near the railroad, railroad, kindly offered to store Haskell's trunk by tactful home missionary work. Saxby sowed the seeds of the Sabbath truth in the visitor's somewhat stubborn heart. Saxby gave Haskell a copy of the little tract, Elihu, on the Sabbath, which convinced him of the Sabbath truth. Brother Haskell decided on his knees in a Canadian forest that he would follow the Bible and obey the Sabbath commandments. Wow, powerful. It's amazing, huh? How God used um, a simple means of converting Stephen Haskell. Please read now. He attended? He attended an Advent conference in Worcester, Massachusetts in the summer of 1854. Fully persuaded that he could convince every member that it was his duty to keep the seventh day. However, his friends would not even listen to him. Mm. One exception to the general reaction of the first day Advents who held this conference gave him courage. Thomas Hale of Huberston, Massachusetts invited the young Sabbath keeper home with him. And in a short time, he and his family another family of four members, and certain others began the observance of the Sabbath. All right. So here we see, brothers and sisters, a simple means that God used to convert Stephen Haskell was a track. And friends, I want to just tarry here tonight and use this as a word of encouragement. You know, we are told we should never let the day go by without doing something to advance the cause of God. Today, as you reflect over your, your day, you came in contact with many people and personages. They came in your home. They came in your space. Did you do anything? Did you say anything? Did you hand them anything? Did you say a word that would put their feet on the right path? If not, friends, we need to reevaluate our Christianity. Our early pioneers believed in the power of literature, the power of track distribution. Stephen Haskell helped to take it to another level. And so, friends, I want to encourage you to purchase tracks, purchase books, you know, and as you go out, keep these books in your car, these tracks in your car. Yeah? And as you meet people in the highway of life, pass it on. Because you never know. Sometimes we think that these things are so in, insignificant. They are so little that they cannot make a difference. Friends, it was a track. It was a track that one Stephen Haskell, one of the, one of the most faithful pioneers, author, evangelist, administrator to this church. A track. No evangelistic no Bible study, no, no, no Bible worker. It was just the simple, the power of a track. And one of the texts that our pioneers used, um, they claimed as they went out into the track business, was Ecclesiastes 11 verse 6, a powerful text. This was the catalyst behind the printing press. The wise man says, in the morning, sow thy seed. Yeah? Sow seeds of truth. And in the evening, withhold not thine hand. So as you leave your home in the morning, as you leave with your, your bagel, your smoothie, your green juice, talk to me now. Don't forget to invest in some tracks. Call Amazing Facts. Call these um, institutions, these ministries that 
that their that their um their 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 their, their ministry is to provide tracks. You purchase these tracks on the Sabbath, the second coming, say to the dead. It's like you purchase these tracks. And the Bible says, in the morning, sow thy seed. You meet people, give them a track. And in the evening, withhold not thy hand. Why? For thou knowest not whither shall prosper. We don't know. Is the evening seed or the morning seed? Or this or that? Or whither they both shall be alike good? We don't know. But the counsel is, sow your seed. I encourage you, purchase, invest in tracks. Go online. Reach out to Amazing Facts. Reach out to GLOW and these other ministries that provide little tracks on the truths, the present truth for this time, and keep them in your possessions. Keep them in your persons. As you're going to walk in, in the morning, bring a track with you. In the evening, bring a track with you. You're, you're riding the bus, bring a track. You're riding the plane, bring a track. Yeah? Bring something. Leave something because you do not know what will prosper. Saxby did not have an idea. He never dreamed of the track he gave out would have made such an uh, impact on the life of Stephen Haskell and led him to become one of the greatest pioneers this church has ever seen. And so, friends, we are admonished. As we go, I want to encourage you. These two statements should be an encouragement for you as you go forth throughout the remainder of the week. So the Lord says, wherever you are, let your light shine forth. Hand out papers and pamphlets with those with whom you associate. When you are riding on the cars, visiting, conversing with your neighbors, and improve your opportunities to speak a word. So hand out pamphlets, hand out tracks, because you do not know what will prosper, the morning track, the evening track, or yea, maybe even both of them. She says, as we wind up, she says, please read now, for a time. For a time, the good seed may lie unnoticed in the heart, given no evidence that it has taken root. But afterward, as the Spirit of God breathes on the soul, the hidden seed springs up and at last brings forth fruit. In our life work, we know not which shall prosper. And I love how she, this, is a, this is a text you want to commit to memory. It's a powerful text because oftentimes, let me just deviate, oftentimes we get discouraged. You see, because we have, we have been bought into this, this, this we have subscribed to this, this, this microwave religion, yeah? We want people to get baptized now. We want to come with a grand testimony on Sabbath. You know, I, I met this man and, and we talk about the truth and he invited me to his house and I'm preaching the whole family and bless God, the, the whole family is here this Sabbath. Yeah, those are rare testimonies. But, and so oftentimes when we don't see the turnover, because we, we're in the microwave society now, we oftentimes get discouraged and we say, we will not no, claim Ecclesiastes 11 verse 6. Sow thy seed in the morning and in the evening do not withhold you because you do not know what shall prosper, this or that or both. Look how she quotes the text. And listen, this was the, the our, our pioneers claimed this text. They did. And they wrote and they, 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 they let loose tracts and pamphlets and what good was accomplished. Read now, she says, God. God's great covenant declares that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Mercy. That's powerful, you know. That's powerful. Please read. In the confidence of this promise, the husbandman tills and sows. Not less confidently are we in the spiritual sowing mm -hmm. to labor, trust in his assurance. Here it is now. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Here it is now. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And friends, I tell when our pioneers got together to print the press, they had no idea the power, the pathos that would lie between the press. Paper and ink are never out of style. And one of the things I realized, brothers and sisters, you cannot argue with a track. And that track may lie dormant, 
you may give that track out, that man may take it and throw it away. Somebody, it, and it will work either work out to condemn him in the judgment or justify someone. So friends, I want to encourage you. Get your ministry started. You're doing, but you can do more. Invest in tracks. Invest in books. And as the good Lord opens the way, you place these books where providence leads you. Claim the promise and watch a harvest generate from your labors. We're going to pause here tonight, but I tell you, we have a lot more interesting facts about the life of Stephen and Askel, a man of action, a man who was one to the church, not by an evangelist, Bible workers, crusades, revival. He was one to present truth just by reading a track. Never underestimate the power of a track. Father in heaven, tonight, Lord, we want to say thanks. We thank you, Lord, because oftentimes we go through life and we become discouraged because we do not see the full outgrowth of our labors. And I just can imagine the millions of tracts that are given out year after year by faithful Seventh-day Adventists. And we know, Lord, that your word will not return unto you void. It will accomplish the things that you have asked it to do. And so I pray that you will inflame our hearts with missionary activities, missionary zeal. Help us to use our monies, O oh Lord, to help to advance your cause on earth. And I pray, and as we sow these seeds, as we give these books and tracts away, may we claim Ecclesiastes 11 verse 6, thus finding encouragement even in the work. May you grant us all, Lord, a good night's rest, sweet dreams, strength to take on tomorrow's challenges. And we pray, O oh God, that when time on earth shall be no more, when Jesus Christ would have finished his work in the heavenly sanctuary, it is my prayer tonight that everyone who has logged on would have been sealed with the slave living God. And thus be prepared for translation is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, saints, we just want to say, all right, uh, we hope you were blessed tonight. We hope you were encouraged um, in the things that pertain to the kingdom of God. Um, we look forward to seeing you on Sabbath where we are continuing our 1844, we are, we are transitioning now to the third feast, the feast, the wave shift, or the feast of first fruits. A very, very powerful feast. We're going to see what we can glean from that. And I want to encourage you guys to keep on keeping on. Let us not become weary in well doing, because in due season we will reap if we faint not. Big up everyone who locked on. Erica Madden down there in Bermuda. Big up yourself. Um, Harrison. Um, big up your Harrisons, big up yourself, M Mr. F Keith Phillip, all right. Uh, Chicone, big up yourself. Who else now? All those on Facebook, Sister Not, Brother Wills, Elder Wilson, Kempton Alert, Wiggins, um, West, Words of Encouragement, um, Tyra Bryant. Um, again, good evening to everyone, and we hope that you have a blessed remainder of the week. We look forward to see you again. And as of always, as we close, in the words of the ancient, I say, saints, behold, the eye forward. <laughs>